Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with HuffPost UK's political editor, Kevin Schofield. And The Spectator's economics editor, Kate Andrews. Welcome to both of you. As ever, let's check out the front pages, shall we? Starting with the Metro, which reports that Russian President Vladimir Putin may be open to peace talks over the war in Ukraine after Kyiv launched drone strikes on Moscow. A poll carried out on behalf of the I suggests the majority of those surveyed are worried about their ability to pay for essentials like food and household bills. The Guardian hears that the government wants to limit council's ability to impose 20 mile an hour speed limit zones because they annoy motorists. On the subject of the government's roads reform, the Sun pleads, now get a move on, Rishi. According to the Financial Times, the government has relaxed the penalties for companies failing to abide by its carbon trading scheme. Critics of the move say it makes it cheaper for those companies to get away with pollution. Daily Mail has seen research suggesting that scrapping the tax imposed on foreign tourists for shopping on Brit in Britain, rather, not on Britain, uh, could generate £10 billion for the economy. It's their ongoing campaign. Uh, the Mirror continues its campaign against dangerous dogs. The Express isn't happy at being left on hold with the tax office for three hours. And the star says five significant rainstorms are heading our way in just the next two weeks. Welcome to August, everyone. Well, a reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch our guests. So let's head straight to them, to Kevin Schofield and Kate Andrews. Andrews. Um, so I'm on the side of the motorists. Here we are in The Guardian, Kate. Uh, now it's 20 mile an hour zones which are going to be under uh, surveillance by this government. So following the three by-elections that we saw, we're getting a lot of updates about um, policies that affect motorists and traffic. And this is because the worst case scenario for the Conservatives, losing all three seats, did, did not come to pass. And they were able to hold on to Boris Johnson's old seat in Uxbridge. And the feeling around that was that that really came down to the ULES policy that's now being rolled out across London, as many motorists rejected the idea that they should have to deal with what they see as uh, regressive taxes, because a lot of the people who are affected by that tax are people who aren't in a financial position to be able to update their cars or get new cars. Um, the Conservatives are capitalizing on that. And now you see that there's going to be a review into these low traffic neighborhoods, LTNs, and the Guardian's reporting that ministers are seeking to curb limits on 20 uh, miles per hour limits. Again, a push to woo motorists. I think what's going to be interesting here is it's not obvious um, that uh, all these motorist policies are going to be agreed upon. Whilst there has been this pushback from ULES, residents of low traffic neighborhoods tend to like those kinds of policies. Uh, so, you know, the conservatives are going to have to negotiate this, but it's very clear that they think a key strategy now may be dealing with these motorist policies and uh, they're going very hard on them now. Yes, and, and they probably like 20 mile an hour zones too. And at the moment, it's local councils who decide, isn't it? But motorists feel that they're going very slowly in whatever direction they need to go in. Um, so making policy, you might argue, Kevin, on the back of a by-election result is fascinating. But will it have traction? And, and will it be popular, do you think? I mean, you're right. It's very interesting. I mean, the fallout from the Uxbridge by-election has been pretty... Extraordinary, really. Um, Rishi Sunak is, is a newfound lover of the car. He even put up a picture of himself sitting in Margaret Thatcher's old car on Twitter this morning. So he's really laying it on thick that he's the he's the on the side of the motorist. I mean, it's debatable. I think it's um, it's questionable whether this certainly will be enough to to um, claw back the, the huge opinion poll lead that, that Labour have got at the moment and have had for almost a year now. Um, and clearly the Conservatives, I think, at the moment, are just sort of thrashing around looking for for things that can maybe just give themselves a little bit of traction, can claw back even just a little bit, get them back in the game almost with the general election coming next year. As I say, it's quite divisive, really. It will appeal to... Um, a lot of motorists who do feel like they're, they're being punished by government in terms of speed limits, um, uh, fuel costs, etc., etc. But at the same time, it will also annoy an awful lot of people who actually like um, the speed limits, etc., as they are at the moment. So, uh, so yeah, 
I think what it does show is that we're absolutely undoubtedly now in a general election campaign. The election might well be at least another year away, but I think we're going to see an awful lot more of this. The Conservatives trying to identify wedge issues, really, that they, they think puts Labour on the wrong side of public opinion and really hammer them home pretty, pretty hard. Yeah, the Metro's got him um, sitting in, the, in a vehicle. Um, doesn't say whether it's the, it's the car you mentioned. PM sits in a classic car after insisting he's on the side of motorists. Um, I think we've got a, a shot of it ourselves, actually. But, um, yeah, there we go, there it is. Um, meanwhile, The Sun um, now get a move on, Rishi. Stand up for motorists' call. Fed up drivers want more change. Um, the whole context of this, though, is uh, the climate uh, crisis, uh, the UN General Secretary saying we're now into a period of Earth boiling. You know, how does it sit? How does it comfortably sit? And why the timing now, Kate? That's a really good question. And I think now that we are in general election territory, I mean, not that it's going to be necessarily soon, but the campaign around it, you're going to see a lot of talk between the cost of living crisis and net zero and the tensions that exist between them. It's very clear that both the Tories and the Labour Party remain con committed to that overall 2050 net zero target. And their language around green energy is still very positive. But I think what's really crept up over the past few months and was confirmed with the by-election, at least in the mind of a lot of these politicians, is that there is a time and place to ask people to spend more money. And ultimately, you are going to be asking people to make some sacrifices on this journey. And now may not be that time with the cost of living crisis so stark, with interest rates rising, really struggling to pay some of those bills. This is becoming a debate. And I, I think the result of that by-election has somewhat empowered the Tories to be able to say things like that. And it feeds into Rishi Sunak's overall philosophy of trade-offs, uh, you know, which is something he's been talking about since he was made Chancellor of the Exchequer right before COVID hit, that if you want one thing, sometimes you do have to temporarily sacrifice another. Uh, and I think everyone's becoming slightly more comfortable with that. It also isn't helped by the fact that, of course, the Labour Party has rolled back some of its green policy agenda and that £28 billion original commitment to green investment, which the party now says it would get to by the end of its first term, but not at the beginning. So there seems to be more acknowledgement of this, and I think you're going to see both parties Parties try to balance this cost of living crisis with these commitments to net zero. Some that they, it may be dawning on them that not all voters are prepared to pay for it right away. Yes, and, and that's what a lot of people have said about the ULES scheme under the London mayor, uh, the ultra-low emission zone, that it is regressive in the sense that those who can't afford to pay it uh, can't afford to get a new car. So that's been, that's been a lot of the debate which we saw in Uxbridge. But let's just um, throw forward, shall we, to what's happening this week. Um, the idea of energy security, you know, separate from the driving issue, but also the same, if you like. The idea that the Prime Minister will, you know, give the go-ahead, um, as we saw in one of the papers uh, today, uh, for a carbon capture, capture scheme. Um, and, you know, you might say that's there to, to hide the fact that he's going to say yes to new oil and gas licences in, in the North Sea, Kevin. This is fascinating for what Labour's going to do about this and, indeed, the SNP, who, you know, might it cost them votes? Who knows? Well, you're right. And, again, this is another area where I think they can serve at the spy an opportunity to really put some clear blue water between them and Labour, um, particularly on North Sea oil. Now, Labour's position there is that they would not approve any any new uh, exploration licences in the North Sea. They would allow the ones that have been um, authorised and are going ahead right now, let them expire, and that would probably run into the 2050s anyway, but they would not authorise any new ones. Now, the Conservatives are saying that puts Labour in the pocket of Just Stop Oil, thereby trying to link in voters' minds the protests, which cause a lot of disruption by Just Stop Oil, with the Labour Party. Um, and again, as I say, they think that the Labour are maybe being put on the wrong side of public opinion there. I think that's arguable, to be perfectly honest with you. I think, actually, the Conservatives have got to be a little bit careful here, because if you look at the polling gen generally on net zero and climate change policies, mm. the public are, by and large, most of them in favour of um, green policies, and they're concerned about climate change and what it will mean for future generations. But certainly, as I say, Labour, um, the Conservatives see this again as another um, clear dividing line between them and the Labour Party. And, you know, I think we're just going to have to 
accept that we're going to get an awful lot more of this stuff now between now and, in, and the next general election. Yes, I mean, that is interesting, isn't it? The support for green policies. And yet, if we look at the eye, people are still struggling to pay their bills, which takes you back to where we get our fossil fuels from and to have cheaper energy, Kate. So it's all wrapped up, isn't it, right now? Yes, this is an exclusive poll for the eye, which reveals that over half of Britons say they're worried about paying for everyday essentials. Nearly six in 10 voters say they are struggling or just about managing with their household budgets. Um, you know, it's it's very grim reading. It's also not terribly surprising and comes in the wake of what we expect to be another interest rate hike from the Bank of England to see that base rate go up yet again later this week. Um, everyone is feeling that crunch. This is you know, the huge pain that inflation causes, um, you know, especially when it's been so rampant as it has been here in the UK, it, it just makes everybody poor. I thought it was very interesting that Chris Stark, who heads up the Climate Change Committee in the UK, uh, actually said to, to the weekend papers that um, there might be a little more wiggle room when it comes to things like banning petrol and diesel cars. It was actually the Boris Johnson government that pushed forward that deadline. There seems to be from the people who are you know, most excited about this transition to green energy, um, most excited about net zero, an acknowledgement that there is a time and a place to ask people to pay for all of this. And, and as Kevin points out, the UK is, is very optimistic about moving towards green energy, and that's a great thing. Um, but, you know, the, the actual crunch that people are feeling this year and probably next year in particular makes it a bit harder to sell policies that could be a lot easier to sell a few years down the road. Mm. I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? We're talking about delays in environmental schemes at a point where, you know, the Antarctic sea ice is looking in a terrible state. You know, the talk about the flow from South America, you know, our Gulf Stream effectively, talking about an earlier date for, for that stalling, which means Western Europe might get colder. So do we have time? Is it necessity to buy time? Because nobody can afford to, to, to install the things they need for net zero. We're, you know, we're, we're in a sort of flux and, and what the politicians do about it will be interesting, Kevin. Absolutely. And, you know, 2050 is a long way in, into the future, but the, the most pressing deadline is, I think at the moment, is 2030 for this ban on petrol and diesel cars. Now, there's a real split in the Conservative Party over this. A letter was sent to Rishi Sunak um, today, signed by 45 Conservative MPs and peers, basically saying push back that deadline to 2035. Now, Rishi Sunak told the Sunday Telegraph in today's paper that that will not be um, moving. So there's obviously a bit of tension there within the Conservative Party. But again, you know, as, as Kate's saying, you know, um, when the rubber hits the road, to part, if you pardon the pun, people um, in general are in favour of uh, policies to tackle climate change. But when it starts to hit them in the pocket during a cost of living crisis, as the, mm -hmm. as the front page of the eye starkly demonstrates, mm -hmm. that's where it becomes a little bit more... Um, questionable whether uh, the public um, will follow through on that support. And I think that's what the Conservatives are trying to tap into right now, because they see that there's potential electoral benefit for them. Well, we'll certainly see how Rishi Sunak does that when he visits Aberdeenshire on Monday and how he tries to square that, uh, that circle. Anyway, lots more still to come. Could scrapping the tax on shopping by foreign tourists uh, generate £10 billion for the British economy? Um, that paper seems to think so. Back in a moment. Well, welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview with me once again, Kevin Schofield and Kate Andrews. Welcome back to both of you. Um, Kevin, let's go to the Metro, shall we? Putin, peace, bombshell, the paper says. I mean, actually, he was meeting African leaders and presumably had to dangle something at them. Anyway, uh, the suggestion was we cannot cease fire when we are under attack. Well, who did the attacking? Um, lots of questions about this, really. Yeah, lots of different news lines coming out of uh, Russia and Ukraine today. Obviously, on the face of it, this looks quite encouraging. Vladimir Putin talking about um, peace talks. But when you actually look at what he said, then the, the terms that he's offering are, would be completely unacceptable to Ukraine. He's talking about basically Ukraine having to accept the, quote, new realities, i.e. Um, the territory which is now under Russian control would have to stay under Russian control within Ukraine, and that obviously is unacceptable to the, the Ukrainian government. So, so yeah, I wouldn't get my hopes up um, for any uh, immediate breakthrough in terms of peace talks there. Um, and, yeah, there's been this attack on Moscow again, a drone attack. Um, Kiev hasn't uh, claimed responsibility, but certainly that's who Russia 
is blaming and Medvedev, uh, the former prime minister in Russia, is now talking about um, nuclear uh, Russia being um, entitled to respond with a nuclear weapon if um, Ukraine continues its offensive. So, yeah, um, lots to chew over from Russia today. But as I say, I think the main takeaway is that despite what Vladimir Putin says, we're not going to be looking at peace, unfortunately, anytime soon. Mm. Um, Kate, let's go to the Daily Mail, shall we? Um, the Mail's campaign about the tourist tax. Now, what is the tourist tax? Because if you're not a tourist, you might not know. And why did it go? And what benefit would it be if it came back? So it used to be that if you were visiting from many different countries, you would get a break on certain commercial goods that you were buying. And this was scrapped in order to raise more money for the Treasury to try to balance some of the books, both from the fallout from COVID, but also all the economic pain that the UK has been experiencing for a myriad of reasons over the past few years, including having to pay for the energy price guarantee and all the rest of it. And the Daily Mail started a campaign back in April to scrap the tourist tax. And uh, research that it has co-commissioned from the Center for Economics and Business Research is claiming that, unlike the Treasury's claim, which says that it, it would lose the Treasury about £2 billion a year, it's saying, actually, we could bring in £10 billion of additional revenue because we get more tourists to the UK. And other countries in Europe are winning out from having um, a, a more generous tax regime for tourists. I think really this, this campaign and this scheme is a lead up to the autumn statement, which is still months away. Uh, but really, you're, you're just seeing this debate continue on the economic right about whether or not we need to balance the books as best as possible or whether we need to cut some tax, go for growth. Um, I, 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 dare I say slightly the, the, the Liz Truss wing of the party, but perhaps in a slightly more relaxed and long term way. Uh, <laughs> and, and you're going to see the debate play out. I think there's more, more acknowledgement from the prime minister and the chancellor that they're going to have to give tax cuts somewhere. But where that's going to be remains a big question. Yes. And that comes, as we know, um, public service staff uh, want even more pay rises. They've had settlements that are, you know, high, but not inflation busting, Kevin. There's, there's still a squeeze on the finances. And the, the, the accusation against Rishi Sunak is he's, he's a bit of an accountant, isn't he, rather than somebody who might inspire effectively in this area. Yeah, there's, there's no great appetite within number 10 or number 11 for tax cuts at the moment. I think potentially we might get something, not necessarily on this uh, tourist tax, but, you know, we might get some um, uh, tax relief in some way closer to the general election. But, um, I mean, as far as this campaign that the Daily Mail is running is concerned, the, the old saying in newspapers was always that you don't start a campaign unless you know that you're going to win it. Um, at the moment, it doesn't look like the Daily Mail are making much headway. As Kate says, they, they launched this campaign in April. Um, they may well have been given a nod behind the scenes by the Treasury that, you know, this might come. But at the moment, there doesn't seem to be much appetite, certainly within government, um, to uh, to scrap the the current um, uh, tourist tax as the as the mail calls it. So uh, so yeah, I think mm. this is just another story just to keep the keep this campaign running. But you know, at the moment, certainly there doesn't seem to be any indication that it's going to be successful. And as I say, the government right now I think needs all the money it can get it get its hands on. So tax cuts are not uppermost in the in the Chancellor or the, or the Prime Minister's mind right now. Mm. I see uh, Daily Express is uh, squeezed in. Um, uh, the Prince of Wales, Prince William, on its front page, uh, down the bottom right there. Flip and Eck, isn't that Prince William serving up burgers, part of his Earth Shop Prize video released, um, serving environmentally friendly burgers from a food truck in South London. There's the moment of surprise. There you go. Thank you very in much. In the meantime, uh, the... Daily Star tells us, Kate, that it's the summer brolly days. I think we've all noticed it. I'm surviving by pretending it's October half term. I don't know how you're surviving. But anyway, five <laughs> Atlantic deluges are heading here over the next two weeks, the paper tells us. Yes, it's, it's not obvious at all that that summer that we had for about two weeks in June is coming back to us. Um, we've got some pretty bad weather ahead. Uh, as you say, it feels a lot more like autumn's return than we're enjoying summer. But of course... Uh, the grass is always greener and you have to be thankful that we're not experiencing some of these record-breaking heat waves that other parts of Europe are experiencing, uh, you know, where that heat is borderline dangerous and people need to stay inside. So, you know, there are... Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. 
you will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.